Good morning, everybody. My name is Diane Amen. As I said before, I am the uh, a chair in international law at the University of Georgia near Atlanta. Um, I am visiting this semester at Oxford as a visiting fellow at Mansfield College and a visiting researcher at the brand new Bonavero Institute of Human Rights at Oxford. And so I'm delighted and very grateful for the Academy for inviting me to chair this panel. Um, I should say that, in fact, this will not be a traditional panel. I've been instructed to, and our goal is to turn this into a roundtable discussion. Um, and so we will have a somewhat different um, format than you saw before. I'm a bit trepidatious of this. Some of you may have heard the phrase herding cats. I feel like I'm herding very big cats given the uh, background and eminence of our speakers. But I'm confident that they will uh, work with our plan, which is that each person will uh, deliver an eight minute precis of what it is they would like to talk about. After those presentations are done, um, I probably will pose some questions, but what I'd also like to ask my uh, roundtable members is as you're listening to your colleagues, um, if you could uh, formulate in your own mind a question that you will pose to the person to your immediate right when we open it up for discussion. And that means that, Rob, over here, you're going to pose a question to David. Um, I want to make sure that everyone gets some questions presented to them. And then at some appropriate point, we will open to the floor. Um, and again, I hope that we will try to engage everybody in this conversation. The topic is comparative analysis, a comparison of the Nuremberg and Tokyo International Tribunals. Um, I'm very excited to see that, and I hope that we can uh, begin to enrich what's already been a rich discussion. One of the things that I hope that we can try to do is make some points or bring in some themes, issues from uh, these really voluminous trials that haven't been discussed before. And so I'm very confident that, that we'll, we'll break some new ground there. I think, uh, Eduardo, you were going to uh, show one slide for me. On the notion of legacy, part of what we've been talking about already here are remembrances, even the notion of souvenirs. And one of the things that I think is really fascinating about these trials is the extent to which they generated souvenirs. If you go on eBay right now, I have just seen in the last week, there is an ID pass for a minor participant at the trial that is going for 8,000 US dollars on eBay. Do not buy it, you can get it cheaper. Um, but one of the souvenirs that to, sort of just blows my mind that existed as to both trials was the effort to get autographs from the defendants. Many of the members of the prosecution team from lawyers on through interpreters at Nuremberg tried their darndest to get an autograph of Goering. And the mentality that wanted that and wanted to save that and make that one of the remembrances that you brought home with you is quite extraordinary and a bit baffling to me, I have to say. But I wanted to share with you from the University of Georgia's School of Law collection, uh, J. Alton Hosh was the first legal advisor to Myron Kramer. He had been working in the JAG Corps uh, in the military during World War II. He demobilizes, goes back to Georgia, becomes the dean of the law school, and then gets pulled back by Kramer, who I believe had been his superior during the war. Says, I can't do Nuremberg without you. Come be my legal advisor. He wasn't there very long. It's not clear what he did. In part, apparently his faculty back home rebelled and demanded he come back and start governing them. So he didn't stay very long. But this is one of the souvenirs that he brought back, which is in our collection. Um, I don't know that, it, it, I, I fear that we are not preserving it as well as we should. This is a paper fan. And you see it's the rising sun of Japan. And what Hosh did in the course of his time there was every rib on both sides of the fan 
is autographed by the various defendants, 21 defendants. And if you can see how it looks from the broad side, you flip, it's the same thing. And then on the picture um, to the right, you see at the top Hideki Tojo, and at the bottom General Matsui, who was mentioned before. And so again, this is a dynamic of what was going on in the courtroom during recesses that to my mind is a bit baffling, but may make us think about how participants understood what they were doing to be historic and something that had to be commemorated and memorialized even as they were doing it. So that's my contribution. And what I'd like to do now is just give you a brief uh, uh, run through of the eminent members of this panel before I ask them to talk. I'd like to give you their introductions for all of them right now so that we can try to maintain a dialogue as much as we can. Um, Professor David Crow is a presidential fellow at Chapman University and Professor Emeritus of History at Elon University in North Carolina. He has done extensive research on the Tokyo Tribunal, although his uh, current research project is a biography of Raphael Lemkin, whom I'm sure most of this audience knows was one of the founders, uh, well, was the coiner of the word genocide and one of the great proselytizers of uh, the genocide convention and the criminalization of genocide. Professor Gary, Gary Simpson, is a professor of international law at the London School of Economics. He too has written extensively um, in this area on Tokyo and others tribunals. Um, and uh, some of his work includes a book known as Beyond Victor's Justice, which is a concept I would hope that we get to unpack a little bit in the course of this uh, conference. Professor David Cohn, further to my left, is uh, the director of the WSD Honda Center for Human Rights and International Justice at Stanford. He was the founding director of a very important documentary archive, the uh, Berkeley War Crimes Center, before he went to Stanford. Um, and as we saw last yesterday, a very close uh, collaborator with Professor Totani, who is our keynote speaker. Dr. Zachary Kaufman um, is senior fellow at the Kennedy School of Government and the Carr Center at Harvard, and a lecturer in, international, a lecturer in law at Stanford Law School. He is um, an expert on many things, including most particularly to this panel, issues related to transitional justice. And then finally, we have already become acquainted with Professor Rob Cryer. He is a professor of international criminal law at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. Um, and as we know, is a co-editor with Neil Boyster of a number of very important works in these area. So gentlemen, thank you very much. I think I will start in alphabetical order unless there is anyone who objects to that. Um, and so Professor Crow, my understanding is that the title of your presentation is Tokyo and Nuremberg IMT Trials. Pardon? Well, then I'm going to go in the order of the program. I'm sorry, I thought the program was in alphabetical order. Um, oh, Cohen would have been first. I apologize. With your leave, Tokyo and Nuremberg IMT trials, origins, proceedings, and verdicts. Thank you. You have eight minutes. Oh, and all right. for all the speakers, uh, if you've noticed, we've moved the microphones very close to people's mouths, and we have been asked to speak very close into them. And I'm quite sure, particularly the folks in the second row, will begin giving us high signs if for some reason we falter and uh, start to lose our voice. So let's try to make sure we can all articulate appropriately. Thank you, David. Okay, thank you. Well, it's enjoyable to be here, and I thank the organizers for their efforts. Uh, sometimes you feel like you're doing research in a void because who do you talk to about the Tokyo trial other than my law school students? Um, the, um, the, the trial was born out of the occupation policies being developed in the United States and Australia uh, before, at the end of World War II, and in large part, um, you start out with the Morgenthau plan, you, you then have Bernays sort of coming in and sort of altering some of that. But you also had specialists in the War Department and the State Department 
who had been really working on the whole question of Japan going back to late 1941, late 1942. Uh, what, what, where this moves to a new plateau, you might say, is that, as you know, the um, American uh, analysis it was that it would take, based upon the ferocity with which the Japanese defended the home islands as, as the U.S. and they got closer and closer to Japan, that it would take uh, up to a half million casualties and two years. And then the other question was, of course, once we get to Japan, what are we going to encounter? And uh, the sad response to that, of course, was Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But by the time you get to that point, uh, the, there had been created a state war Navy committee that really, and they in turn are answerable to the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I mean, anything sent by what we call the SWIC committee to MacArthur in the early days of the occupation always had to be filtered through the Joint Chiefs of Staff to sign off on it. So by late 19, uh, by late August 1945, MacArthur has been appointed uh, SCAPE, uh, uh, Supreme Commander Allied Pacific. And he's been given you know, very, very powerful powers, for lack of a better word, to uh, oversee the occupation of Japan. But what you have to be careful with that is after the war, and his reminiscence of uh, MacArthur claims that he is, of course, the architect of the occupation and what he wants to do with Japan, which is totally untrue. This was being dictated to him by this uh, uh, War Navy uh, State Department Committee. And so by early, 19, early September 1945, now, now that he's in Tokyo, he begins to get directives from, from this committee that basically dictate to him um, the nature of the policies. It also gives him a vast amount of power. Uh, and the same is going to be true for the whole war crimes issue. Uh, and this comes pretty quick. Now, what, what are they feeding off of? They're basically feeding off the uh, Nuremberg Charter, but also understand that below the surface, a lot of other things had been happening that also apply to this. Or you may or may not know, for example, that within days after the war ends in Europe, uh, U.S. military is, beginning, is initiating war crimes tribunals, small commission trials, uh, I call them kangaroo court trials. So you have actually in the field, in, in Europe, you've, and if you look at, at, at what they're charging some of these German defendants with, they're the same sort of things you're gonna see on, on a much more uh, lengthy basis coming up in the context of the Tokyo trial. So it's, it's not as though you go into the whole question of war crimes trials cold. Okay, the way to understand, for me at least, to understand the Tokyo trial and many of the problems that I think were, were, would be natural to this type of tribunal was that you have to filter everything through the, the larger occupation policies. In other words, the whole dynamic of the occupation, American occupation of, of Japan is going to be very different than the four power occupation of Germany. And I think it's already been alluded to that, that uh, what, uh, what MacArthur is after is a totally rebuilding of Japan Part of it's gonna be educational, particularly in the context of the trial, but also um, there's a, a, a totally different approach. I think the decision, for example, that was made in Washington, not by, by MacArthur, not to indict the emperor. While legally it was a bad decision, in terms of a practical basis of the application, it was the exact right thing to do. Um, and once that was done, it changes the whole tincture, you might say, of the approach to war crimes trials. And we don't really have time in this eight minute presentation to mention that, but at least to know that there's uh, really a complex issue at play here when it comes to the whole question of indictments and war criminality and things like that, that in large part will be in governed, I think, by the approach to the emperor. Uh, now, the other question that comes up is, is about Keenan, and, I, and I, again, we don't, I don't have time to go into the Keenan issue now, but maybe in the discussion we can give to it. I sort of take a different view of Keenan. Uh, some people see him as a drunkard, drunken incompetent. Uh, no, he was not. He might have had a problem with alcohol, but it's hard to prove. But he was a very, very fine, one of the finest criminal prosecutors in the United States when he was appointed. And he wasn't appointed to get him out of the White House because he was, had a private practice by this time in New York. And, and that's, again, that, that's something we can get into later. Um, I think the, um, the trial bogged down in large part because Keenan wanted to, 
he, he felt that in choosing defendants, you had to sort of, as any prosecutor would, you, have to, you had to build a case individually in terms of their criminality based on, on evidence. Instead, Crumbs Carr, who was head of the executive committee of the uh, prosecutors, uh, team of prosecutors, he wrote a memo in February 1946 in which he said, we should simply choose defendants who simply represented the nature of Japanese criminality, which of course is created an extremely complex, divisive issue, and I think it plays into to how Keenan reacted to this, how President Webb reacted to this, and it's something that we can explore, explore farther on. Now, it came up last night. Why hasn't the trial, why wasn't more attention given to the trial? After the Nuremberg trial, uh, we flooded every American library of any consequence with copies of the entire transcripts of the Nuremberg trial. Why didn't that happen with Tokyo? Well, as it got towards the end of the trial, uh, the JAG, uh, Judge Advocate General's office in the State Department approached MacArthur and said, we want to publish the transcripts of the trial, but we want you to pay for it. Well, by this time, there had been a growing body of criticism of the trial, and so Keenan and MacArthur began to talk about it. In fact, they were so upset over this, over this, uh, over this criticism that in some of their meetings later in the trial, 47, 48, that they basically, both of them said, we never want another trial in Asia, which of course flew in the face of the fact that when this all started, there were to be numerous uh, Class A war crimes trials as well as a number of Class B and C trials. Um, and so to make a long story short, what was finally decided was that, uh, and, and they kept negotiating back and forth, well, let's, let's do the indictment, let's do, let's, let's do the, the, the judgments and things like that. Uh, and they finally decided we're not going to do anything. We just, because they were afraid that if the records of the trial were published, and then that in turn forced a reaction uh, from the public in, in the United States, or whether it be a reaction in Japan or something like that, in the end they decided not to publish anything. So this meant that from 1948 until the early 1980s, there were no transcripts. There were about, of the, of the various Americans who served as prosecutors or defense attorneys, uh, there were about 40 sets of the trial records they were given individually. And uh, until 1981, that's all that was out there. So this is the reason that, of course, I think the lack of factual evidence in terms of print testimony and, so, and transcripts is that the trial was basically forgotten. Thank you. A great starter to our discussion. Um, Professor Simpson, you are uh, speaking on something I love, the coinage, Tokyo Berg. Um, I don't think I've ever spoken for eight minutes before. Uh, this is quite an exercise. Um, so uh, I, I will explain the title in a moment, but uh, I, did, I did a little bit of socio-legal research into what people understood by the Tokyo War Crimes Trials before I came out here at, at dinner parties and so on amongst non-lawyers. Um, and the, the, the first question is, was there a trial at Tokyo? So, so there's a great deal of ignorance uh, about the very existence of the trial out there in the world. Um, and then the second question was, what, well, why are you speaking about the Tokyo War Crimes Trial in Nuremberg? Um, I rather like that idea, though. I was once asked, though, by a tabloid newspaper in London uh, to talk about the trial of Adolf Hitler at Nuremberg. So sometimes there's a very low base of knowledge out there in the world. So um, Nabokov, the famous novelist, was uh, interviewed by um, the Paris Review once, and the reviewer said, I have, I have 37 questions, uh, and Nabokov said, I'm ready. Uh, I only have two arguments. Uh, one argument is about Tokyo, and the other argument is about Tokyo Berg. Uh, the argument about Tokyo is that, for me, um, Tokyo embodies a sort of classic tension at the heart of the whole field of international uh, criminal justice um, between what I'll call the enthusiasts and the skeptics. And this clash 
It begins at Versailles in 1918, where the Japanese, in fact, are on the side of the skeptics in their uh, reservations at the, uh, at the Commission on the Responsibility of the Authors of the War. Uh, but the skeptics at, at Tokyo are, are represented by people like Rowling, Bernard, and of course, especially uh, in, in Justice Powell's monumental uh, dissent. And the enthusiasts, though they're not very enthusiastic in some respects, um, are the other wing led by um, Patrick uh, McDougall and so on. But in another deeper sense, uh, Tokyo represents um, the anxieties that we have about the project of international criminal justice uh, itself, or the ends of international criminal justice. And I'll just mention sort of four of these uh, as quickly as I can. One, one is about impunity. So there's a sense that with each international trial, we're both ending impunity and also enforcing impunity somewhere else. Uh, and I think this comes through strongly in the Tokyo trials. We, we, we sort of begin the project of ending impunity in relation to crimes against humanity, but at the same time, there's a sense that there's a whole hinterland of impunity being created in relation to, say, the use of nuclear weapons or biological experimentation or what we're called comfort women. Um, the second anxiety is about the consolation uh, of victims. So again, the project of international criminal justice seems to be about victims. Um, but again, at Tokyo, we have a sense that um, whole groups of victims are disregarded or neglected by the trial. And, and I can't help thinking this is also a continual tension or theme at the heart of the discipline. And then thirdly, uh, the idea of um, telling a history, as what Lawrence Douglas called a didactic legalism, the idea of pedagogy at the heart of these trials. Um, so again, Tokyo tells a story about the Pacific War, um, but there's also a sense that this story could be or could resemble uh, certain aspects of what we call show trials. And it's very striking for me the similarity between especially some of the early trials in international criminal justice and the show trials. And this too comes down to the personnel. Vyshinsky, a major figure in Moscow in 1935 and 1937, also a major figure at Nuremberg. And the same, same thing with one of the Soviets at Tokyo. Um, so that's Tokyo, but I should say something about Tokyo Berg because there's some curiosity out there in the audience about what it's about. In fact, many people come up to me this morning and say, this is what I think it's about, and all their ideas were more interesting than mine. So, um, so, so two ideas behind Tokyo Berg. One is that it, it, it sort of mashes together, in a way, this single post-war moment. Uh, and so when I teach the post-war moment, um, I call it Tokyo Berg. Uh, as we know, it looks very much as if Tokyo borrows from Nuremberg. It looks very much as if Nuremberg is some sort of, or, or is in some sort of parental relationship to uh, Tokyo. But for me, describing that period as Tokyo Berg places Tokyo uh, at, at, at the front or, or front front and center of the international criminal justice moment. And I do try and teach that Tokyo Berg moment in that way. But the second idea I want to get, get at from this phrase, Tokyo Berg, is that it is the relationship between Tokyo and Nuremberg. And I'll just briefly finish with that. So there are four or five relationships, however. Um, one is that the relationship between what we might think of as the tribunal established by treaty and the tribunal established by decree. And that's run right through international criminal justice from the ICC to the ICTY and so on. So here we have the idea of Nuremberg as a, at least to a certain extent a treaty-based tribunal and Tokyo as a tribunal established by the decree of well, a single individual in a sense, MacArthur. And then there's a second idea behind Tokyo Berg, which is the relationship between the European center and the extra European periphery. Again, something or a relationship that lies at the heart of international criminal justice. Is international criminal justice fundamentally a European project? Uh, or is it a project by which Europeans somehow apply uh, retributive legalism elsewhere? 
Uh, and then thirdly, there's the idea of the relationship between permanence and ad hocness, which again lies at the center of international criminal justice. Is this, is this a system about permanent international criminal trials, or is it a system in which we simply establish a whole series of ad hoc tribunals? Uh, and it seems to me we begin at least in an ad hoc mode at Tokyo um, and Nuremberg. But let me finish in my final minute by saying that in a way, uh, Nuremberg might represent, and some of you will disagree with this, a sort of smooth consensus, uh, a monumental history to, to think in Nietzschean terms about this. The idea of staying the hand of, of vengeance, as Robert Jackson puts it. While Tokyo represents something much more anarchic and dissentient and fragmented, a sort of alternative Weltanschung, and that's my only German word of the conference. Um, so these, these ideas are represented by uh, uh, Robert Jackson and Justice Powell, two of the great figures of international criminal justice. So Jackson is desperately trying to assert here, I think, the detached majesty of law um, in a hotbed of ideological conflict. So he's speaking law to power, if you want to put it in these slightly banalized terms. Paul is desperately trying to bring law back into politics and history. He, if you like, is speaking power uh, to law. So Paul inaugurates a tradition in my last remaining non-minute, a tradition of introspection in international criminal justice. Uh, that the Japanese too had at, at Versailles. And this tradition is carried forward by people like George Bell, the Bishop of, of Chichester, Hannah Arendt, Rebecca West, Judith Schlar, who's been mentioned before. And it's an indispensable um, idea um, in international criminal justice, a project, after all, populated by visionaries who, thinking they have transcended the political, seem perpetually surprised to find themselves in the midst of it. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> Professor Cohen, it is now truly your turn. Thank you. Uh, thank you, I declare myself an official fan of Tokyo Berg. Um, no, and also because it really is important, I think, that research be informed um, by consideration of the two tribunals together, and that's my point in the title of my talk about the double standard, Nuremberg and the Tokyo double standard is um, I think the failure of many scholars who are criticizing Tokyo to consider whether or not those same criticisms apply with equal strength to Nuremberg and whether they would be willing to make those criticisms of Nuremberg. Very easy to jump on the bandwagon of discrediting Tokyo, but different than Nuremberg. We should also recall that in the post-war period and particularly in German academia beginning the, um, in uh, the early 1950s, it was a great fashion to attack Nuremberg. Um, Hans Heinrich Jeschek, one of the dominant figures in um, uh, comparative criminal law and criminal law in Germany, founder of the Max Planck Institute in Freiburg, wrote his Habilitationsschrift, basically attacking um, the Nuremberg Tribunal um, and its illegitimacy on the basis of ex post facto law. It's, um, yet, here we sit today, here we sit today commemorating Nuremberg and why is there no such institution in Japan and why is it actually unthinkable that there would be? That's part of my point. So um, obviously I can't make an argument in eight minutes. I'm just going to sort of throw out some points that maybe um, we, can, we can discuss. Um, and this, uh, just some examples perhaps of the uh, double standard. So we have already heard about gender politics um, and it's a frequent criticism of Tokyo um, as Professor Orenthe here eloquently stated, um, that people who have not read the trial record um, and certainly not looked at the exhibits um, say that it was only in the 1990s that rape was tried and so on and so forth. Okay. But who turns that around to Nuremberg? Now, why, why was rape not included in Nuremberg? Obviously, systematic Systematic um, uh, forced prostitution was practiced by the Wehrmacht, particularly on the Eastern Front and in the Soviet Union. Obviously, there were um, numerous incidents um, of rape throughout German occupied territories, again, particularly in the East. One reason was, to, was the two quoque argument that we heard before. 
the Red Army when it occupied the, what became the Soviet occupation zone of Germany, according to what I think is the best research, was responsible for the systematic policy-driven rape of approximately two million German women during the first six months of the war. Uh, sorry, the first six months of occupation. Um, clearly not somebody that uh, a crime that the Soviet Union um, would necessarily want included. Um, we heard the argument yesterday from Professor Onuma about, well, you know, it's a shortcoming, all of this history and the Tokyo judgment. I wonder when the last time that Professor Onuma looked at the Nuremberg judgment, which if you do look at it, after the first very short substantive part of the judgment on the charter principles, what is the next section of the judgment? It's entitled, The Nazi Regime in Germany, The Origin and Aims of the Nazi Party. It begins with 1919 and goes to 1945, because although Tokyo is criticized for um, extending its jurisdiction from 1928 to 1945, in fact, the time frame under consideration um, under the conspiracy charge at, um, at Nuremberg was 1919 to um, 1945. Um, was Nuremberg a show trial because it aimed at education? I mean, sorry, was Tokyo a show trial because it was part of the program of democratization that the Americans were driving in Japan? Well, if it was, so was Nuremberg, because Nuremberg was, extent as were the other trials, extensively used in American propaganda um, and education um, and so forth um, in post-war Germany during the trial and afterwards. Um, we might also recall that in the Nuremberg, um, that in the Nuremberg Charter, we have the principle of collective responsibility in addition to individual responsibility because six organizations are indicted in which mere membership is made criminal of six organizations. It thankfully was then fell to the judges at Tokyo to say, well, um, uh, uh, um, unlike what it says in the charter, there is a general principle of, um, of legality uh, that there must be a mens rea and there must have been knowledge um, of the criminal nature of the organization. There were individuals convicted in the, to in the Nuremberg subsequent proceedings only on the charge um, of membership in a criminal organization. We also heard, oh, well, at Tokyo, the people weren't present in the courtroom. Well, I'm not even sure what that means. Um, but I would, um, uh, if they weren't present in Tokyo, they were certainly not present um, in Nuremberg. And as Justice Jackson said in his opening statement, quote, we would also make clear that we have no, we have no purpose to inculpate the whole German people, um, end quote. Um, we've also, um, Tokyo has attracted a great deal of criticism because of the conspiracy theory that was indeed the dominant theory of the American prosecution team, but that was likewise the case, um, that was likewise uh, the case at Nuremberg. And if you read the opening statement of Justice Jackson or if you read Justice Jackson's report um, on, the, um, on the Tokyo, uh, on the Nuremberg trials, in fact, he complains to the State Department that the judges at, at Nuremberg unfortunately did not fully understand the meaning of the conspiracy charge um, and thus did not apply it um, did, did not apply it systematically. So I have two minutes left, I see, so I'll throw out a few more um, things that I hope will arouse some controversy. Um, were there better judges at Nuremberg, um, the A-team? I would say that the best jurist at any of the trials was Justice Webb, contrary to um, the malignment of him as being um, erratic and um, sort of um, riding roughshod over people. He may not have been a pleasant person. Um, I didn't know him. But if you read the unpublished Webb judgment of 650 pages, you will see that Webb goes far further than either the Nuremberg judgment or the majority judgment um, at Tokyo in analyzing the legal issues and applying them systematically to each one of the accused according to a carefully articulated theory of liability. For me, that is what makes a good judge in such um, in such a trial. Um, so um, I think uh, probably I will, um, I will close with that. Um, and just following on that point um, about, um, about Webb, um, there's not much law in the Tokyo judgment. I mean, there's the articulation of the principle of individual responsibility. There's a, there's a few pages of discussion of the law of the charter. 
But judged by modern standards, there's actually very little law um, in, that, in that judgment. Um, that is to a significant degree tr true of Tokyo. Um, there is probably in the number of pages in the majority judgment more discussion of law, but as Professor Totani pointed out yesterday, they actually, the judges may articulate some standards, but they inconsistently apply them. I think that's another area that we also have to look at carefully. So I'm all in favor of Tokyo-Berg, and when we talk about Tokyo, let's talk about Nuremberg too. Thank you. Thank you, and I think w one of the things we're getting is a lesson in the importance um, of not taking characterizations at face value, and particularly if it's something that's core to your argument to um, beginning to do some investigation on your own. In the Nuremberg uh, situation, much of the research I'm doing right now points to Judge Burkett as a, as a very important figure, and perhaps judicially one of the more important figures. He's someone most of us have never heard of. He was the, the deputy judge um, for the British team, but it turns out he wrote the draft, the first draft of the judgment, which was no inconsequential thing, in part because Judge Lawrence, by his wife's reputation, was, quote, somewhat lazy and didn't want to do it. And so Burkett, not unlike Keenan, was talked about as a party fellow and uh, being very lighthearted, but perhaps sometimes the archival research will tell you a different story. I guess as an Irish citizen, I also would be very trepidatious about attributing drunkenness to someone of an Irish surname. I think we tend to move in that direction perhaps more quickly than we should, um, particularly when, if you look at these, everyone was partying all the time on their off hours. There was a lot of alcohol and there was a great need to release uh, one's emotions from what they had been experiencing during the workday. So I think we need to be careful about that as well. Our next speaker um, is uh, Dr. Kaufman and he is going to talk about the modern implications of the Tokyo Tribunal's subject matter omissions. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the International Nuremberg Principles Academy for organizing this event and for inviting me to participate. I'm truly honored. Uh, thank you to Vivian, Eduardo, and others from the Academy who have worked so tirelessly on this conference. Um, and thank you to our esteemed uh, chair, Professor Amen, um, for moderating us today. As we've already discussed, uh, neither the Nuremberg Tribunal nor the Tokyo Tribunal addressed all of the egregious offenses that were committed during World War II. And what these tribunals didn't cover is as significant as what they did. We've, uh, I'm going to concentrate my brief time here on the Tokyo Tribunal. And as we've already heard in the first panel from Professor Ornlicker, um, sexual violence, though raised in, um, in evidence, um, wasn't, wasn't fully addressed in the Tokyo Tribunal. Um, but I'm going to focus on a, on a comparatively uh, lesser known um, uh, category of atrocities, and that's human experimentation. Insufficient attention to these uh, heinous crimes by the Tokyo Tribunal and since has um, strained relations between Japan and its neighbors as well as elicited ongoing efforts to pursue acknowledgement, redress, and ultimately justice. During World War II, Japanese uh, performed experiments on at least 3,000 civilians and allied soldiers. The Imperial Japanese Army's Unit 731, led by Lieutenant General Shiro Ishii, conducted the most notorious research in Manchuria. These experiments, which are sometimes referred to as the Asian Auschwitz, included vivisections, dissections, weapons testing, starvation, dehydration, poisoning, extreme temperature and pressure testing, and deliberate infection with numerous deadly diseases, such as bubonic plague, cholera, anthrax, smallpox, strep, and syphilis. The victims were Chinese, Russian, Mongolian, Korean, and allied POWs, and some were children. The US government offered immunity and other incentives, including money, food, and entertainment, to over 3,600 Japanese government agents, physicians, and scientists involved in these barbaric experiments. 
After being granted immunity, some Japanese participants in these experiments assumed prominent roles, including senior positions in the health ministry, academia, and the private sector, and post-war Japanese society, allegedly with the assistance or at least the knowledge of the US government. Declassified American documents and testimony from Japanese involved in or knowledgeable about the human experiments reveal that the U.S. government was interested in the potential utility of the work of Shiro Ishii and other Japanese, however unethical, to the U.S. military. Senior American officials felt that obtaining data from the experiments was more valuable than bringing those involved to justice because the information could be used to advance the US government's own weapons development program. American officials also were concerned about preventing other countries, especially the Soviet Union, from obtaining the data. Unlike Joseph Mengele and some of his Nazi associates who performed similar experiments on humans but were, who, but were uh, according to some, uh, too famous to be uh, collaborators with the United States, the Japanese human exper experimenters were all relatively anonymous. And as a result, the US government could pursue its strategy undetected, and American policymakers could partner with implicated Japanese officials without much fear of a public relations backlash. The incipient Cold War and the superpowers attendant desire to secure comparative advantages and scientific advancements thus chilled the US government's enthusiasm for investigating and prosecuting Japanese human experimenters. American officials believed that the research would be useful in the arms race between the Soviet Union and the, and the United States. Apparently untroubled by medical ethics, consistent with its own post-war human experimentation in Guatemala, the US government reasoned that it could keep its deal with involved Japanese secret. Even if it could not, the exchange they reasoned could be worth the fallout. Japanese human experimentation remains a sensitive subject, with, Jap with Japan's neighbors continuing to call on the country to be more forthright about the atrocities that it perpetrated. According to a Chinese med uh, media report recently, the subject of Unit 731 is seldom mentioned in Japan, with authorities eager to cover up and even deny it's, uh, this part of history. Some observers impute malice to an incident that happened a few years ago when Prime Minister Shinzo Abe whose grandfather was a Class A war crime suspect, posed in a jet with 731 written on it. Unsatisfied with, the, with Japan's willingness to acknowledge Unit 731's operations, in recent years other countries, particularly China, have taken it upon themselves to document and publicize the experiments. In 2015, a museum of war crime evidence by Japanese Army Unit 731 opened in Harbin, China. Last year, the museum released new evidence about Unit 731, including written confessions of unit workers, records of human experiments, photos of unit soldiers, and an incubator for producing plague. More recently, researchers at the Harbin Academy of Social Sciences in China found more than 2,300 pages of previously unearthed files about Unit 731 at the US National Archives, the Library of Congress, and Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Some within Japan have, though, taken steps to uncover Unit 731's operations. Last year, J Japanese public broadcaster NHK released a documentary, the, the Truth of Harbin Unit 731. The same month, the Japanese writer published a new book, Beyond ba Behind Bayonets and Barbed Wire, The Secrets of Japanese Army Unit 731. And last month, the National Archives of Japan disclosed the names, ranks, and personal information of 3,607 members of Unit 731. This is the first time that almost all of the names of the, units, of the unit's members have been released. Given that the Tokyo Tribunal failed to address Japan's human experimentation, coming to terms with this atrocity is long overdue. The recent uncovering of fresh evidence about Unit 731 suggests that more documents may still be found. Academics and investigative journalists should continue such archival research. To aid their efforts, Japan and the United States should declassify any remaining documents relating to the experiments, including which Japanese officials were involved in the Allied Forces' decision not to seek their trial before the Tokyo Tribunal or other post-war courts. Japan should also issue a full and public apology for carrying out, and the United States should do so for covering up these horrendous events. Although it's likely too late to ensure accountability, 
for the perpetrators or redress for the victims of Japanese human experimentation, these steps could at least help promote greater historical awareness and acknowledgement about the respective roles of Japan and the United States in this horrific crime. These steps offer a means of addressing the past while promoting reconciliation among people and states for the future. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Kaufman. Um, Professor Cryer uh, is going to speak. Uh, uh, his paper, title of his paper is Now and Then the Contemporary Relevance of the Nuremberg and the Tokyo International Mi Military Tribunals. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I imagine you can all hear me. In terms of legacies, I want to compare and contrast the two a little. Um, in particular, the reasons that we have, generally speaking, a positive view of there being a Nuremberg legacy. And the Tokyo trial actually for a long time seeming to have very little in terms of a legacy. And this wasn't um, expected by at least some members of the prosecution. So in 1947, one of the prosecutors, uh, someone called E.M. Haider, said that the Tokyo trial is one of the three most important trials in history. He said, it stands there with the Nuremberg IMT and the trial of Jesus. High hopes. <coughs> um, I think it's fair to say that probably doesn't bear up so well today. Um, but when we speak of legacy, I think we need to bear in mind certain things. And that, that we are talking of legacies. There are different types of legacy. So there are legal legacies. There are historical legacies. There's documentary legacies. And there are political legacies as well. And Nuremberg tends to be given a good passing grade, at least, in relation to these legacies. Legally, Nuremberg is considered a landmark in law. Um, I think practically all of us can scare our students or people at dinner parties by citing very, very precisely the very famous statement by the Nuremberg Tribunal that international crimes are committed by men, not by abstract entities, and it's only by enforcement of international law against individuals can it, its be provisions be enforced, and individuals have duties that transcend the obligations of the state. For those of you are counting, 1947, 41 American Journal of International Law, page 172, page 221. I do that to the students every year. It's, it still entertains me. But you cite it that often. Um, there's no little irony, of course, that the prosecution, and many at the time, tried their very best to ground Nuremberg in the existence the pre-existence of all this law anyway, and then turn around and call it a landmark. You pays your money, you takes your choice on this. Either it's a revolution which stands as a landmark, or it was just completely banal. It was just what was already there. Um, historical legacies of Nuremberg, much of it has generally been accepted. But that said, there were distortions in the Nuremberg judgments. In particular, the Katyn Forest Massacre was fudged because the Soviet Union wanted to prosecute the defendants for the massacre of about 10,000 Polish officers when all of the evidence pointed to the fact that it was the Soviet Union. Similarly, how you can discuss the invasion of Poland without mentioning the Molotov-Ribbentrop Molotov Pact is it's more than a sin of omission. But generally, we don't really criticize the Nuremberg Tribunal for these distortions in a way perhaps the Tokyo trial has been not given such an easy ride. Politically, we know it has a legacy. We have conferences about them. We know it has a legacy. We have an institute. Tokyo, as has already been mentioned, not so much. Um, indeed, Sharif Bassayuni, back in the 80s, said that the Tokyo trial was a precedent legal history can only consider with a view not to repeat it. 
The difficulty really in many ways for Tokyo is people weren't even remembering it, never mind trying to learn its lessons. Um, so let's look quickly at legal legacies. Early on in the trial, at least some of the judges had very high hopes thinking that this would stand alongside Nuremberg, bring forward international law. But quite early on, the judges split. Webb gave early drafts of the judgment, which fell on very stony grounds with others of, other members of the judiciary there. And in fact, quite early on in the trial, the Canadian judge, Judge McDougall, um, wrote home to say, the trial is going to be futile and the judgment is going to detract from international law. Because if the judges are split, they're going to say different things, they will be dissensus. There will not be the clarity because you'll get dissent, you'll get counter-narratives. Of course, one thing that we often forget about Nuremberg, to, to take David Cohen's call, is of course there was a dissent at Nuremberg. Judge Nikitchenko, the Soviet judge, dissented. He said they should have convicted all of the criminal organizations and they should have hanged Rudolf Hess. One thing which I'll come back to, which I think is very notable, is in the printing of the judgment in the American Journal of International Law, Nikitchenko's dissent is not contained. Uh, you have to go to the record of the trial to get Nikitchenko's dissent. Um, but the Tokyo trial, in the end, as has been mentioned, didn't do that much in relation to pushing the law forward. They largely said, do you know what, we just agree with, um, with Nuremberg. The reason being, firstly, for the majority, they didn't want to fragment international law. Secondly, a number of the judges, they did seem that there was some pressure on them to dial back and to support Nuremberg. But also, General Assembly Resolution 95-1 had been promulgated, and in that consensus resolution, the General Assembly had said the Charter of the Nuremberg Tribunal Statute and its judgment reflected general international law. So if anything, actually, Tokyo had a slightly stronger legal basis than Nuremberg, because it had already been said by the General Assembly, no, this, this is the law and it was the law. Furthermore, Tokyo actually, in terms of command responsibility, it did actually expand it out to civilians. Nuremberg had very little to say about command responsibility. The reason being, they had the documents. Command responsibility was developed to get over evidential difficulties, both in Yamashita, but also in the Tokyo trial. In Nuremberg, they had all the documents. In Tokyo, a lot of those documents had been burnt. The Nazis had actually issued decrees trying to get German archivists to destroy their archives. But like archivists throughout the world, you do not ask an archivist to destroy their archives. Um, in terms of the process, there were mistakes. But I think, in fact, we, we have reason to be slightly more sanguine in retrospect. Um, documents. There are documents from Tokyo, but one of the reasons for the lack of scholarly attention is the difficulty in getting hold of these documents, up to and including the transcript for reasons we've already heard about, but also the judgment. It was very, very difficult to get hold of until 19, 1977. Um, with that, I have been told to stop, so I will. Um, in terms of modern links, I wonder whether the relation between Nuremberg and Tokyo perhaps finds its echoes in the relative degree of attention paid to the ICTY and the ICTR, for reasons we can perhaps discuss. Um, but I do think it's important to look at Tokyo, um, and because I'm British, I have to refer to Arthurian legend. Nuremberg often comes across like Sir Galahad, the great good knight that never did any wrong. Tokyo, to me, is more interesting. It's like Lancelot, good stuff but flawed. Thank you. Thank you so much, and great thanks for adhering to the time. I think that'll allow us uh, lots of room for some productive discussion. If I may, I'd like to throw out a question that I hope um, is relevant to uh, most of the themes that various speakers have been 
developing, and I welcome anyone to jump in. Um, I'd like to interrogate, as I mentioned before, this concept of victor's justice. One of the things that I think the we that we've been talking about, what, what those of us in the room understand to be popular or social meanings of these two trials, um, we tend to forget that at least in the United States, the Nuremberg Project underwent significant criticism as it was happening from no less a source than the Chief Justice of the United States and most of the other uh, brethren, as they then called themselves, who were not Robert Jackson. They were very unhappy, um, both from a personal standpoint about his departure to Nuremberg, personally because it meant they had to do his work, um, but also from a legal standpoint, because they felt quite strongly, and this comes out both in public statements and in letters that they wrote that are now available in their personal papers, they felt that there was not significant due process from a procedural standpoint at Nuremberg, and they were very concerned about the legality issues. In fact, Chief Justice Stone, while the trials were on, referred to it as Jackson's lynching party over there in Germany. That, it's interesting to me that that critique, which was at the elite level in the United States at the time the Nuremberg major trial was going on, has been lost and that there's this notion that it was all seen as all good. Beyond that, I think when we think about Victor's justice, most of us go first to Tokyo because we know about the Richard Benier book. But of course, there was a critique of Victor's justice at Nuremberg, albeit limited exclusively to legality and Nolan Creeman issues. Um, and Rob alluded to why that might be, that maybe the General Assembly resolution made that less of an issue at Tokyo. But why was it, if we understand Victor's justice in the Tokyo context as referring to, well, they committed war crimes too, who are they to be judging us? Why is it that that theme, and this goes to what David Cohen was saying about maybe when we compare the two, they're more alike than not, why was it that we don't understand Victor's justice at Nuremberg to have included the problem um, of carpet bombing by the Allies throughout Germany? Particularly if you look at pictures of Nuremberg while they were trying the case. Had one looked out the window, one would have seen nothing but rub rub rubble. As late as 1948, participants are still complaining about the stench of dead bodies. How could we not have an understanding of Victor's justice at Nuremberg that questions um, the charging patterns there? So those are kind of the questions I'd like to throw out, and any responses that anyone has to those, I'd welcome. Yes, Professor Cohen. Um. I hate to disagree with our moderator, but I will. Um, the, um, you know, frankly, I just think the topic of Victor's justice has been beaten to death um, for at least the last 50 years. Um, the, um, I, I mean, one of the problems in the huge literature that goes back to 1943 in law review articles and international law journals raising the issue of Victor's justice um, that is before before Nuremberg even starts. Um, you know, is um, first of all, there's no you know, there's a wide wide variation in the use of the term victor's justice. And in order to have a productive discussion, I think we'd actually actually define what that means because it's used in many different ways, in many different contexts, and for many different political agendas, and some non-political agendas. Fortunately, um, obviously, I mean, you know. The charge was made of Nuremberg, Kruntzbuhler, um, the um, uh, defense attorney for Admiral Dernitz was quite articulate on this issue. Dernitz himself in post-war, I mean, in interviews after his release from Spandau, 
um, made this point. Um, it was made extensively in the German academic literature of the 1950s. Obviously, it was made um, from fairly early on um, in Japan as well. And it became sort of infamous in um, the Anglo-American world, in particular with uh, Miniar's book, which um, is really more a book about the Vietnam War and a particular view of American imperialism than it is about Tokyo. And many are, like a number of other scholars, was certainly fundamentally uninformed about what actually happened at Tokyo, but that didn't bother him. Um, we, did have, we did have the view of Justice Stone, but I think the um, United States Supreme Court was hardly in a position to talk about due process in regard to war crimes trials after the horrific opinion that was delivered in In Ray um, Yamashita in which the dissenting opinions um, basically said that the court was condoning judicial murder um, by, um, by refusing the habeas corpus petition. So, I mean, we're dealing, I think, with an incredibly, um, with an incredibly fraught landscape um, and one that's not easy to engage in um, sort of a brief discussion, but I'm not sure that it's the most productive discussion to have about Nuremberg and Tokyo. Um, and I think one of the great virtues of some of the um, contributions that we've heard yesterday and today is that there are other agendas. There are issues that have not been explored. There are issues that have not been sort of driven into the ground um, in, regard to a liter in regard to a controversy that is really more political than juristic. So um, uh, you can uh, uh, sort of take that however, um, however you like. Uh, yes, let's start that way and well, come forward. So oh, well, very, Rep. very gentlemanly, okay. yes. Um, I guess I respectfully disagree that it's not a subject worthy of discussion. I've spent far more time than I want to admit going through the Tokyo transcripts and the Nuremberg transcripts over the years. And in some ways, if, if we're looking at, you know, I teach in my law school, uh, International Criminal Tribunals and International Humanitarian Law Courses, 3L courses. And that's one of the, 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 the issues I, I, uh, I, I throw out to my students in terms of what do you feel in terms of the body of evidence that, that you have an opportunity to look at. How do you feel about this issue? My own sense, and this is just an opinion, is that in some ways, in some way, there was a greater effort at Tokyo to conduct a fair trial than there was at Nuremberg. There was a pace at Nuremberg. They wanted it over in a few months. And I think, for example, the issue of, of slowing the trial down, allowing, I mean, the defense had almost, had almost as long during the trial to present their case as the entire length of the Nuremberg trial. The, the issue of the language, they did really try to address it. Uh, this doesn't mean that, that the decisions were flawed uh, or some of the processes were flawed. But I think that, that, that for, for Tokyo, where the starting point, as you say, was, was the question of, was this victor's justice? That's, uh, that's, that's something tricky to get into. And it, but, but I think in terms of, of fairness, I think there was an effort, uh, much to the dismay of the prosecutors, of the judges, and so forth, because uh, for those of us that have spent time in court, uh, working on cases and things like that. There's a dynamic to courts that people from the outside who've not done it really don't understand. And I think in, in terms of the, the difficulties of conducting this trial over a two and a half year period, both for the prosecution and the defense and the defense and defendants themselves, was extremely complex. And they could have done like they did at Nuremberg and, and conduct a speedier trial. But I think, uh, and this is where I come back to, I, I agree with you about, about Judge Webb. Uh, I think he was a far better uh, judge than, than, than most people uh, feel, that I think he himself bent over backwards, even, even as annoyed as he would get with some of the stupidity of the lazy prosecutors and the lazy defense attorneys, uh, bent over backwards to go, conduct a very, very fair trial. And uh, I think, I think one of the principal flaws in the trial was Keenan uh, really 
you know, Keenan was an extremely, one of the best prosecutors uh, in the United States. He had, he had a tremendous track record. And he was chosen by Truman not because he wanted to get him out of the White House, because basically he had, his, he had a very successful law uh, practice in New York. But it was because he was recognized as a top-notch criminal prosecutor. And I think where Keenan fell and um, got into trouble was um, he was quite correct in terms of his experience as a prosecutor of starting out going to China and where the worst of the war crimes were committed and um, uh, tried to begin his investigation of witnesses and things like that because he, he, he did want to, to, to deal with war crimes and crimes against humanity. But when the executive committee rebelled and said, no, we simply want to choose defendants based upon them being representative of certain crimes, I think he was dismayed by that, and I see, 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 see I, I think you see this being acted out in the transcripts. That a, a, he he differed quite, quite greatly with many of the other prosecutors in terms of the approach they were taking in the trial. Um, I join Professor Crow in thinking that um, Professor Amen is absolutely right in continuing to raise the question of. Uh, Victor's justice and how it compares in the in the cases, the context of, of Nuremberg and Tokyo. Um, clearly, they, they share a lot um, in that, uh, for example, both only included judges from the um, victorious um, allied powers. But there is one distinction, um, at least one distinction, um, which is quite obvious, um, that uh, separates the two contexts, and that's the, the presence or absence of um, the use of nuclear weapons. Um, and for many, of course, this remains um, uh, a real question um, as to you know, the fact that the United States is the only country to date um, that has used uh, atomic weapons, not once but twice, and Japan remains um, to this date to be the only country that has, um, uh, that has suffered nuclear, uh, nuclear attack, not once but twice. Um, and, uh, and that is a distinction that, that remains um, and continues to raise uh, legal and moral questions uh, about um, the fairness of, uh, of not even considering um, uh, this tactic uh, during, during the war. Um, and as we were encouraged, by the way, to ask a question of the person to our right. Uh, okay. Okay. Um, I quite like talking about Victor's justice, but I do think it tends to be used as a synonym for a show trial. And I think we need to think a little more carefully about disaggregating the term victor's justice. One is victors, and that's about the identity of the actors. And in truth, at the end of the Second World War, there weren't that many states that weren't involved one way or the other. Secondly, I think we need to look at justice, which is a separate issue to identity whereas the two tend to get run together. And it's just assumed that because they were the victors, it was unfair. And generally, as I say, Nuremberg gets a, a decent passing grade, but Tokyo doesn't. In part because things have been influenced very heavily, I think, by Powell's dissent, which contains a very lengthy and somewhat overstated critique of the processes at Tokyo. But also, of course, very stinging critique from Judge Bernard, who said that the process was so unfair that he couldn't actually give a judgment on any of the individual defendants. What it looks to me from what Judge Bernard said was, he just didn't like the fact they didn't apply French procedure. Um, it is often the case, I think, that judges, both in criminal and civil tribunals, assume that what is right, good, and rational is what happens to be done at home. And it's something which is, it's a problem which has bedeviled international tribunals or international criminal tribunals since. Um, in terms of actually with Tokyo, whether there was unfairness, there probably was some, but we are now starting to reappraise some of the criticisms of, to of the Tokyo process. So Judge Webb came in for criticism for not being able to control the bench. Try controlling 11 judges. Try control 11 academics. 
<laughs> I think we all know that it's not going to happen. <laughs> Bear in mind they spoke different languages. Bear in mind the structural constraints, the one microphone. That wasn't Webb's fault. Furthermore, in terms of translation, I think we are now a bit more sanguine about the problems the Tokyo trial had in terms of translation. Um, Nuremberg was tolerably easy in comparison. German, English, French, they're from a family of languages which can work with one another. Japanese to English, it's not so simple. And that's one of the reasons it took time. Another thing, at the time, it was criticized for being huge, sprawling, over length, taking far too long, two and a half years. Tell that to the ICTY, tell that to the ICC. It now looks like it was a breakneck process. Um, also, just on a very individual note, one of the reasons why it took quite a long time was they had to take recesses over the summer. The reason for that being in particular, although by no means only, Lord Patrick was not a young man and he was not a well man. And the Tokyo trial was taking place under huge, huge theatrical lights, which were very hot. And Tokyo in the summer can get very hot. And they were genuine fears that Lord Patrick would have a heart attack. And if you look outside at the photos of the Nuremberg trial, which of course occurred in this very, very room, now we have lovely chandeliers. You look at the lights they were, they were working under in, in the actual trial. These are huge, huge burning lights. So I'll stop there anyway. Um, I think it's an irresistible uh, topic. I'm, I'm sympathetic to, to David. I, I mean, having written, having edited a book called Beyond Victor's Justice. I can't seem to get beyond Victor's Justice, but I, I mean, I was thinking about what the justice of the vanquished might be like. Um, we, we need to imagine or ask the question, you know, who, who is going to perform uh, justice if not the victors? So the question might be not so much whether, whether the victors should perform justice, but what sort of justice they perform and in what conditions they perform it and, and how <coughs> universal their aspirations to perform justice might be. Um, in, in fact, what I think's happened in the transition from the 19th to the 20th century is that we have in a way criminalized defeat, which is a slightly different way of, of putting this. And that, that's a major shift in international diplomatic relations. A 19th century audience in Nuremberg just wouldn't understand the sorts of discussions we're having. So the major effect I think inter international criminal justice has had on us as human beings is that it's completely transformed the language that we deploy when we think about war and peace. We automatically think of our defeated enemies as potential war criminals, as people who may have committed the mythical beast, the crime of aggression. As A.J.P. Taylor, the English historian, once said, states don't commit crimes, they make mistakes. Uh, and I think that sums up the 19th century position rather well. So we've moved from a society in which states are understood to have made mistakes to a, a society in which defeated states are understood to have made a mistake but also committed a crime. Uh, just just on, on, on Tokyo, I mean, I think Tokyo is, is very complicated. One could describe it as a form of victim's justice after all. Can we really describe uh, the, the, the Philippines or China or India as victors? So one of the things I'd like to celebrate about the Tokyo war crimes trials is its, is its anarchism, is its diversity, is the fact that there were these 11 judges, uh, many of whom had radically different views about how the world should be organized. So it's the very split, it's the thing that's deplored about the Tokyo war crimes trial that I rather like about the trial. Thank you. Professor Cohen, I think we disagree and agree in somewhat equal parts. Um, I'm very glad that you mentioned the Vietnam context and I think it would be really fascinating for someone to do a study of Vietnam and Tokyo and look at how the, well, Vietnam and international criminal justice and the extent to which, uh, at least in the American context, understandings of those trials uh, 
uh, reflected the Vietnam experience. I think not only of the book that we just discussed, but Telford Taylor revisits uh, Nuremberg after My Lai Massacre in a book called Nuremberg in Vietnam. Um, Mary Kaufman, who's a name you may not be familiar with, she was one of the prosecutors at the IG Farben trial um, and one of the founders of the National Law Lawyers Guild. When she goes back to the United States, she spends most of her career representing draft resist resistors and people prosecuted in the various Red Scares. And she writes a series of articles about uh, Nuremberg and Vietnam that are highly critical of the United States. Um, I also think of Peter McGuire's book, Law and War, which is about the ministry's trial. Um, he is writing very forthrightly and overtly uh, through the lens of what was called the global war on terror and what you can learn from that. So sometimes what we take away from these historical experiences is very much informed by our own current context. What I'd like to do now is what I had said we would do next, which is to invite each speaker to pose a question to the person on his right. And I think I'll start with Professor Coe. Uh, Professor Crow, I'm sorry, if you could pose a question to Dr. Kaufman, please. Okay. Um, in addition to the uh, Unit 731 crimes, there were also a series of uh, medical experiments done in Tokyo and other parts of, of East Asia. Could you just comment on those as well? Um, yes, thank you for, for asking, um, because of course Unit 731 is always the, uh, is always the focus. Um, and it's, it's mostly because that's where um, most of the crimes were perpetrated, most of the experiments. Um, and you know, it, the only comment I, I really have on this is that it, it, it was more of the same. A lot of it was directed um, by Unit 731. A lot of it was in collusion with um, universities um, in Japan um, that were working with different medical units or different scientific units um, that were supposedly, um, you know, trying to uh, develop um, uh, you know, ways to drink, to purify water and, um, and have, uh, you know, more sanitized uh, living uh, conditions during a difficult time. Um, but the, um, you know, most of the research remains focused on Unit 731, but I think you're right that we need to expand it. Uh, so thank you. Um, so Professor Cryer, I, I have a question actually following up on our discussion of, of Victor's Justice. Since you've written so extensively on um, the design and staffing of, of the Tokyo Tribunal, I wondered if you could comment since you know, the Tokyo Tribunal remains um, so criticized for Victor's Justice, what, what would have been an alternative um, that, that actually would have been realistic um, in terms of the design and staffing of the Tokyo Tribunal. So unlike in Rwanda and the former Yugoslavia, the UN really hadn't come into existence yet, so there wasn't really this you know, robust international body that could be turned to to, uh, to, to try to, you know, in, an, uh, in sort of a moderating way, uh, adjudicate um, or set up an adjudicating system. Um, there were already 11 countries that were participating. Um, you know, would you suggest that we uh, pull back on the on how many countries are represented as judges? Um, add Japan, um, and if so, uh, doesn't is, doesn't it remain problematic that Emperor Hirohito remained in office, and would that have complicated um, some sort of appointment from from Japan? Thank you. In truth, I'm not sure there was much else they could have done in, in at the time, as you say. It wasn't really a UN, although, of course, it was created in 46, so the UN had, you know, we were post-Dumbarton Oaks, but it was not doing a great deal at that point. Um, in terms of more states, the problem was, at the end of the war, there were many states on the Axis side, and the Allies were not going to, to countenance any Axis judges. And bear in mind one thing that we haven't spoken about is who, who, would, who would the vanquished justice or what it would look like? Well, we do have one example, Leipzig. <laughs> um, and Leo Gross, when writing about the Nuremberg Tribunal, wrote of Leipzig. Um, it taught us one thing, how not to prosecute war criminals. <laughs> um, furthermore, in terms of neutral states, there weren't really many 
Um, and those that had remained neutral, the Allies were deeply skeptical about. Um, so Switzerland, okay, Switzerland was formerly neutral. The Allies actually thought it wasn't that neutral at all. But also the mentality was very much summed up by Winston Churchill when he said, I refuse to be neutral as between the fireman and the fire. And all neutrals were seen as suspicious at one level. Adding more states, that's adding more judges, that's adding more complexity. I do think the bench was too big. It should have been representative. What may have been a better thing to do was to have fewer states on the bench, but keep the IPS, the International Prosecution Section. Rob, you need to pose a question to Professor Cohen, please. Be nice, please. <laughs> How do you look so handsome and young? <laughs> um, I guess my, my, my other question, my follow-up question, is do you wonder if the fact that we now have moved to looking at Tokyo a bit more is because with Tokyo there are still unmined seams? I'm not sure there's much more that can be done about Nuremberg, or perhaps there is, and if there is, what, what would you suggest there to be? I think about Tokyo, um, there certainly is more to do. And I think, you know, from the perspective of those of us who um, write and teach um, in the West, um, we have a vast amount to learn from um, our colleagues in Asia. And particularly, as Professor Totani pointed out yesterday, there is literally a mountain of Japanese scholarship on Tokyo. I mean, there's a library of, of scholarship. There's 70 years of scholarship, and if you, Professor Totani was too modest yesterday to mention along with the book that you and, and, and Boyster wrote, the book that she wrote around the same time on the Tokyo trial, which actually has a chapter that traces the genealogy of the different stages the Japanese scholarship goes through. So I think um, the, you know, one of the problems is that those of us who don't speak and read Japanese simply don't have access to that. And it's a tragedy that so little um, has been published. I mean, for example, um, I hate to um, disagree um, about Unit 731, but it wasn't in 2015 that the Japanese started writing about it, or in 2010, it was in the 1980s. And in fact, a book that was published by a famous Japanese novelist who became aware of, of, of um, uh, of Unit 731, published a book which in, um, it has never been translated, but its Japanese title is usually translated as The Devil's Gluttony. It sold over two million copies in Japan. And it then produced a huge public interest in Unit 731. There was a big exhibition in Tokyo in the 1980s where they reconstructed some of the chambers and so forth from Unit 731. Why don't, we, why don't we know this? Because we don't read the Japanese literature, because we can't. Um, and, and so I think, you know, one area where we need to engage is both in the Japanese document. I mean, there are Japanese documents that we also don't have, uh, uh, those of us who don't speak Japanese have, have access to, and then there's the literature. So I think, you know, there, um, there's a lot, um, uh, and particularly then, I think also the relationship between the way that evidence moves from the national trials um, that are taking place all over Asia Pacific, in the Philippines, and the Dutch East Indies, and you know the British and Australian trials, and so forth, the way that the national prosecution teams are selecting evidence that they're bringing that they're bringing forward or that they're not bringing forward. For example, the evidence on enforced prostitution um, of both Dutch women and um, and Indonesian women um, uh, in um, in the Dutch East Indies and so forth. So I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. I think there's a lot of work to do. I don't want to say that there's not a lot of work to do on Nuremberg, but I think that it, comparatively. Um, Nuremberg is, 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 better, is better trodden ground, and I think there is um, a, lot, um, a lot still to do on that. Um, I just want to, um, <laughs> just because you asked me the question, Rob, um, uh, comment on something you said, which was about Bernard, 
and I'm very glad that you did. What he specifically says in his dissenting opinion is what you said, but it's because there's no investigating judge at Tokyo. And he said an the office of the investigating judge is essential to due process and that no trial that hasn't been prepared by an investigating judge actually um, is worthy of the name, which is an astonishing statement, but does bring out the, as you said, the very different perspectives that are represented by the, this incredible agglomeration of judges coming from different backgrounds and legal traditions at Tokyo. Um, it, thank you, and uh, thank you so much for crediting Professor Totani's book. I, I found it really a valuable um, resource and very eye-opening, particularly, as you said, as to Japanese perspectives and a reminder that we need to look at that. Um, I would say as well, I have recently been chided by one of my German scholars at Göttingen um, as the representative for all English-speaking people for not sufficiently reading the German literature on Nuremberg. And I think that that is a fair critique. Um, I, in my work, am trying to do that as I can. I have much more facility with French, and I think we need to remember there's very little written about the French role at the major trial. Um, it's almost a linguistic vacuum, and I think that in some ways is even less excusable given the facility that many English speakers have with French. It's quite shocking that there hasn't been much dialogue between those two linguistic groups. So even within Nuremberg, there may be more work of that translinguistic nature that needs to be done. Professor Cohen, if you could pose a question to um, Professor Simpson, please. I will do that, but I'll add another word about Professor Totani's book. I think that the book by Cryer and Boyster and the book by Totani that came out more or less around the same time in the early 2000s, th those two books completely reshaped the field. They're, they're, they're landmark. And her book, which was translated into Japanese, was reviewed in all, more or less all the major newspapers in, in Japan and just said, okay, this is the new starting point. I mean, this is now this is now the standard. And I think that shows how much work there is still to be done that even you know, at that date, the field could find sort of fresh life and new orientation. And we owe both, we, bo we owe our colleagues um, a debt of gratitude um, for that. So my question is, um, just in sort of a follow on to this, what do you think are the most important research questions that we should be asking as we look ahead, um, both for Tokyo and particularly the relationship of Nuremberg and Tokyo? answer a different question. Um, um, so I'm going to come back to what, I, what I'd like to do is defend Leipzig for a moment, uh, which seems like an eccentric task really, but um, so we have a problem in this field. Uh, we tend to describe certain trials as failures and others as successes. We've already interrogated that claim in relation to Tokyo and Nuremberg. I just wonder if the Leipzig trial was so bad. Um, let's think about the alternatives. The Allies actually hold a trial of the Kaiser. I think that would have been a nauseating affair given the record of the Western Allies in Africa and Asia in the 19th century. Um, that would have been a lot worse, I think, than the, the Leipzig trial. So the fact that international criminal justice came to a shuddering halt at the German Supreme Court in Leipzig seems to me like a, a good thing. Um, it might have been that some glorious enterprise of international criminal justice would have provoked the rise of the Nazi party sooner than it happened or later than it happened. I don't know, but, but that, that's to indulge in counterfactuals. I just think that, that there would be something very sus suspect about a trial of the Kaiser that early in international uh, criminal justice. So I'm with the, I, I was with the Dutch government on that one. Their refusal, their refusal to surrender the Kaiser, I think, struck a blow for international criminal justice rather than against. And, and just a follow-up to that point. Um, so here's, here would be my research question then as well. Um, what's the relationship between the projects of international criminal justice and other values we might have? Um, so one other value we might have is is diplomacy. Um, so the value of actually forgetting some stuff 
uh, the value of amnesty or amnesia. Uh, I mean, the international diplomatic system begins in 1648, they say, at the Peace of Westphalia, uh, at Munster and Osnabrück. And in the Treaty of Osnabrück, there's a, there's a phrase that, that goes something like this. Uh, um, as we rebuild the international system, uh, we choose to forget the troubles that have gone before uh, and embrace a form of oblivion. Um, so this is, this is international diplomacy beginning in, a, in a, what I call a, a, an anti, anti-impunity mode, saying there are bigger values here in the system than prosecuting war criminals or those who are alleged to have committed some crime of aggression. That won't always be the case. It won't even most often be the case, but my feeling is that it might sometimes be the case, that there might be compelling reasons not to try certain individuals in certain ways. And I think that's what Justice Powell um, captures in his dissent, a dissent that itself has been subject to a certain amount of revision in, in recent years. Ask me another question. Well, I would just add that Justice Paul says that what we shouldn't forget are the crimes of the Allies and that a true Tokyo trial would have had only British and American defendants and no Japanese defendants. So it wasn't that he was opposed to the idea of, of a trial. He just thought the wrong people, the wrong countries, um, were on trial, which is a rather astonishing opinion um, at the end of the 14 years of war in the Asia Pacific. Thank you. Um, there is a new history of the Leipzig trials that just came out within the last couple of years. Does anyone remember who the author? There are. I, 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 don't, I don't know the name of the author, but there are two books coming out. One's well, there, called The Trial of the Kaiser, and the other is called The Trial of Adolf Hitler. Well, fact, the, there, the, the, the book called The Trial of Adolf Hitler is already out. This is a trial right. about the, 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 beer, the beer poach. Um, and um, Bill Shabas is about to produce a book uh, called The Trial right. of the Kaiser. So there are these sort of, there, there are right. two books, but that's not the book you're Yeah, and there is, there's a Leipzig book that came out within the last two years. Bill's book will be out in November. I didn't know about the Hitler book, so we'll have an opportunity to look at that. But you all have been profoundly patient, and it is now time to open the floor to the audience. Um, so I will... Uh, call on people, and I would ask you when you are called upon uh, both to use the microphone and to identify yourself by name and affiliation so we all have a sense of who we are um, as a community. Yes, sir, uh, the gentleman in the back there. My, and maybe my, if you could stand, too. It's easier for the, oh, the people at the panel sure. to see you then. My, my name is Raul Pangalangan. I'm a judge at the ICC, and I'm from the Philippines. Uh, I've come across one account which says that the real difference is that in Tokyo, the cultural milieu was different. The, um, uh, the centrality of law was not there. The role of the courtroom as the arena for judgments of right and wrong uh, simply was not present the way it was at, at Nuremberg, where everyone, both the judges, the bench, the, the different publics, shared the same, um, uh, the same uh, point of reference. And that is why uh, one critique of Keenan in, in Tokyo was that he sort of relied on some natural law uh, reasoning, which was totally alien uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the Japanese uh, population. I ask this because this continues to be a problem for the um, campaign to ratify the Rome Statute in Asia. Asia is the least represented uh, uh, among the uh, state's parties. And um, uh, perhaps that is one reason that we are campaigning among uh, you know, countries for whom the idea of going to court, punishing individuals according to law, is not exactly the way things are done. My, other, my related question is that, if that is the problem was, were there enough Japanese lawyers to be a defense counsel for the Japanese defendants, familiar with the adversarial process, familiar with you know, the presumption of innocence, et cetera? Thank you. Thank you. I think given the the nature of the panel, maybe I'll take three questions at a time and you can parcel out among yourselves which you'd like to answer. Dr. Banerjee, if you could identify yourself, please. Maximilian's University, uh, Munich. Um, this is more of a comment than a question. 
Apropos the question of victor's justice, yesterday Judge Pillai commented that the elephant in the room is Hiroshima and Nagasaki. The other elephant in the room is, of course, colonialism. And not only decades of Japanese colonialism, but centuries of British, French, and Dutch colonialism. Is, um, I mean, the idea that the British and Americans should face trials is not so uh, ridiculous if one remembers that one of the biggest uh, crimes against humanity, the Bengal famine, 1943, latest studies assume that it's up to three million dead, engineered by British colonial interventions. The point that I'm trying to raise, however, is more complicated. Do we necessarily need to think of anti-Western imperialism as antithetical to the demands of international or what Paul would call global criminal justice? And, and I, mean, I don't want to say much about this today because I want to talk about this tomorrow. But I think we need to presume to ask this question that there is, seems to be a, a, a sort of consensus in previous scholarship that Paul is antithetical to the demands of international criminal justice, whereas we can think of a very important part of anti-colonial struggle, which is about criticizing sovereign impunity, because colonialism is seen as the most climactic manifestation of sovereign violence possible. So the kind of criticisms of, of against Nazi violence and the kind of criticisms against any kind of colonial violence, whether done by Europeans or Japanese, it is important to connect them. And that is where the question of victor's justice precisely comes into being. Because as, as Derrida, for example, says in Inspectors of Marx, that justice which flows from the recognition of responsibility to the other is justice, not something just which just comes down top down. And I think in its most generous reading, that is what Paul and many other people would also have thought about. Thank you. Another question? Yes, right there. My name is Valentina Poloni and I'm from Heidelberg University. I have a question to Professor Simpson. Uh, during your talk, you mentioned something that interests me a lot, uh, namely the issue of uh, show trials. Uh, you said that there is a certain link between Nuremberg and Tokyo trials and early war crimes trials that happened to be Soviet trials uh, that took place in, as early as 1943 and show, show, uh, Soviet show trials. So. Does it make Nuremberg and Tokyo show, show trials? And what is a show trial? When does a trial become a show trial? OK, so we have a question about show trials. We have a question about colonialism and the um, International Military Tribunal Project. And we have a question about uh, the centrality of law and the resonance of natural law, in particular at Tokyo, and the role of Japanese lawyers um, at the trials. Who would like to address one of those? Um, uh, I'll start with Professor Crow, and um, you don't need to answer all three. If you can choose one that sort of jumps out at you, I think we'll get them all answered by the time we go around the room. Well, I think the first two, the first two questions is, are, intrigue me because I, it's something that I've been working on. It's sort of one of my pet projects in terms of the trial which is uh, the role of the Japanese lawyers. Um, as you know, um, there were some very prominent Japanese lawyers, lawyers who headed these teams, and they were, unfortunately, uh, the organizers of the tribunal felt that there weren't significant uh, Japanese lawyers trained in Western law to be able to, to uh, come to the fore. But if you go deep into the trials, you know, after the war, after the trial was over, the Japanese government published a six-volume set of documentation that was rejected by the judges in, in making their decision. And I've gone into those files, and what jumps out at you, because you really, because you're talking about 50,000 pages of trial transcripts, are the statements by these, the opening and closing statements of many of these, of three of these very, very fine Japanese lawyers, some of who had been educated in the United States. And the points they make, and it's really not come up yet, but the points they make in defense, it deals with, first of all, the colonial issue. Uh, this is well before Justice Pyle, uh, uh, Paul wrote his judgment. But their arguments principally center around two topics that I think go to the first two questions, which is, first of all, this was defensive. Now, you know, today in China, uh, the Chinese government still talks about the era of colonialism and abuse by the Western powers. Uh, and, and, and it is, if you spend any time in China, this is still a subtle but very, very important theme. So this issue of 
the crimes of colonialism is not an ins insignificant issue in, in Asia because it's never really been addressed. We know, for example, that one of the principal themes of the British in terms of the conduct of the trial was that they wanted to put a good face forward in terms of regaining control of their colonies in East Asia. Uh, the, this theme uh, made the, the principle that two, two issues come up in, in the comments of these Japanese lawyers. The first one is, of course, that, that, the, tr that the actions of the Japanese in World War II were defensive. Uh, they look back to, say, the colonial period and say, we watched you in the 1840s and 1850s ravage China and make it a doormat of East Asia. It became a world in which the entire coast of China was taken over by various European countries. We, as a nation, Japan, had two choices. We could become a doormat like China, or we could become a competitive Asian nation that would compete with the Western powers. And uh, Japan, as you know, at that time, had m limited natural resources. And they said, look, when you later, 1940, slap uh, quarantines on us in terms of natural resources, we took this as act of war. And that Pearl Harbor was simply our attempt to forestall what we, we, we saw as an American, American effort principally uh, to take over and dominate Japan. Now, that may be a fallacious argument, but it is one that, that was made and that was, this is a, a core part, not only of the Japanese lawyers, but a core part of the arguments of the American defense lawyers. Uh, and whether it's an invalid defense or not, the fact remains that there was very much a cultural and ethnic dimension to much of this, I think, that's really not been addressed. You know, people walk around it because it's a highly sensitive subject, but I think it's something that, that hopefully over the next day and a half we can discuss more openly because it is something that's at the core of how at least the Japanese attorneys and the American attorneys who assisted them argued very strongly in the 11 months of the defense section of the trial. Thank you. Professor Simpson, uh, there was a question put to you directly, so I think I'll come to you next. Yeah, that's a great question um, about show trials. Um, apparently, when the uh, Soviet prosecutors arrived in Czechoslovakia in the early 1950s, uh, just before the, the, the trial of Rudolf Slansky took place, um, their Czech counterparts said, we're having trouble finding evidence for these crimes. And the Soviet prosecutors responded by saying, we haven't come here to find evidence. We've come here to stage trials. Um, and, and in many ways, that's the essence of a show trial. There is a, there is a definition, and this goes back to Judith Schlar again, who said that a show trial was the a liquidation of political adversaries uh, using a legal procedure. Um, so the question you have to ask yourself is, does Nuremberg and Tokyo fit with that definition? Um, to a certain extent, they do, and to a certain extent, they don't. So it's more interesting to think about the parallels because the differences are very obvious. One would far rather be tried at Nuremberg in 1945 than at Moscow in 1937. I'll just put that on the table immediately. But there are some rather uncomfortable continuities between Moscow 1937 and the trial of Bukharin and 1945-46 and 48, the trial of Tojo Gorin et al. Um, I mean, for one thing, uh, a show trial might be marked by the way in which the accused emerge as defendants before a trial. So this often happens because of some anterior political project. These are the sorts of defendants we want in order to demonstrate how this particular political project that we're engaged in might work, or these are the sorts of defendants that will work best for us. And I think there are commonalities between the show trials in Moscow and the Nuremberg war crimes trials in that regard. It's clear that the defendants at Tokyo, and to I think a larger extent at Nuremberg, were chosen for political reasons. They, they represented certain sectors of the, of the, um, German, the German state. Um, secondly, the ad hoc nature of these trials, the, the fact that they are trials for a specific purpose at a specific time in relation to specific individuals also has a slightly show trial ring to it. The um, French philosopher Merleau-Ponty said that the uh, defendants in Moscow were subjectively innocent but objectively guilty. They were subjectively innocent uh, 
but objectively guilty. It's an utterly chilling phrase. No one could argue that the defendants in Tokyo, least of all in Nuremberg, were subjectively innocent. But I think the idea of objective guilt is rather important. The idea that, that there's a shift in the historical and political forces that produces guilt at the international level. That, that for example, Colonel Gaddafi seemed to be objectively innocent for a long time while he was being courted by, for example, the Blair government in the United Kingdom, or indeed by my own institution, the London School of Economics, but then became objectively guilty because of a change in the configuration of diplomatic and political forces in the world. So there is something very provocative about this idea of shield trials. Thank you. Um, others, particularly on this question of um, the resonance of various bodies of law um, yes. at the trial? Um, yes, Steve. Cohen. <clears throat> yeah, just following up on those points, which I think are very well taken. Um, I mean, isn't this an issue that's inherent um, in the um, attempt in a post-conflict setting or a post-genocide setting to identify those who are most responsible um, and typically heads of governments or whatever um, I mean, Milosevic um, and others, um, uh, others of that ilk. Um, I mean, this is a complaint that defense lawyers at the international tribunals, I mean, frequently make is, you know, can the presumption of innocence really work for my client who's been infamous in the international press for the last five years or 10 years or, um, uh, uh, or whatever? And then, of course, I mean, there's the issue of the selection of accused, and that's an issue that comes before every one of these trials, because in mass atrocity settings, uh, there's more or less a very wide range of individuals. I mean, in, in, um, when the Allied um, uh, war crimes investigation teams were working to compile a list of significant or potentially major war criminals um, for, uh, for Nuremberg, uh, they wound up with something like 5,000 names on um, on the list. Now, eventually, 119 or whatever it was were put on trial in the Nuremberg subsequent proceedings, um, but that hardly exhausted um, the field. So the question of how do, you, how do you select, it's a question that can't be avoided. And you're right, of course, in the case of Nuremberg, it was very deliberate that you chose defendants who represented different parts of the German of, of, the, of the Nazi party, of different ministries, of the occupied territories, of the German high command, and of course then they more or less messed up on German industry because they indicted, the Americans indicted the wrong Krupp, um, uh, Al, um, uh, Gustav rather than Alfred, so Alfred had to wait until the subsequent proceedings. But I mean, that was a very deliberate choice, but what, but, but, but what else could they have done? And I think that's part of the dilemma, and I think that's the issue that you're raising there quite well. So. Um, in relation to show trials, um, I think Powell also described them as crude morality plays. Um, but it did lead me to think, can you have a fair show trial? Is it inimical? Because if it's a morality play, all trials are morality plays at one level. It's reaffirmation of particular norms. And in Nuremberg, as, as we've heard, and I, I agree entirely, the defendants were shown as they were emblematic. Does that mean they can't get a fair trial? Um, because largely speaking, particularly, and this is something that I was discussing with people yesterday, when we look at the fairness of the Nuremberg and Tokyo trials, what we have to do is bear in mind the standards of the day. We can't look with 2018 ICCPR eyes on post-war trials in 1946 and 1948. It was just different then. Um, in relation to colonialism, um, one thing which I think Powell's judgment perhaps overstates is colonialism. That doesn't answer, for example, China. It may be that some of the Western states, and well, the UK was a colonial power, I mean, that's not exactly a secret, 
But China wasn't. But colonialism was also absent in other ways. So for example, Japanese colonialism in Korea was not really at issue in the Tokyo trial. And so there were other omissions which perhaps ought to have been thought through. In relation to Japanese lawyers, um, there were some very good Japanese lawyers um, on team. I mean, I would say in particular Take, Takeyanagi was, was an outstanding legal mind. He was also trained in the States and he was the professor of Anglo-American law in, um, in the University of Tokyo. Also, he was very heavily assisted by the rather idiosyncratic uh, British international lawyer Thomas Batty. Um, in terms of the closing arguments that you mentioned, Takeyanagi actually published them in Japan after the trial. Uh, getting hold of the book is extremely difficult, I wouldn't deny it. Uh, and if we can turn the cameras off, I might have a thermostat copy. <laughs> um, it's practically impossible to find. Um, but uh, the Takeyanagi book and its closing arguments in the transcripts are clearly the work of an incredibly talented lawyer. Where I think perhaps they... So I think the, the, the Japanese lawyers understood the law. What they weren't was used to the process which was being undertaken in terms of the procedural aspects of the trial. Those were quite alien, I think, to the Japanese lawyers, which is, of course, why US lawyers were sent over to help, because they were adversarial trial lawyers. But the difficulty which then came from that was that the Japanese lawyers wanted to run a very different type of defense to the US lawyers. And so the defense itself was split. Thank you. Dr. Kaufman? Um, on the point of uh, show trials, um, the definition I, I typically think of and use is um, are, are trials that are perfunctory with a foregone conclusion. Uh, and, um, you know, in the, in the case of both Nuremberg and Tokyo, as we've been talking about, they're extensively documented um, over the course of several years. Um, but one thing that is, you know, pretty interesting, I think, in a, a difference between the two of them is, whereas there were no acquittals at, at, at Tokyo, there were some at, at Nuremberg. And yes, there was a, a case of mistaken uh, identity um, contributing to that, um, but nonetheless, it wasn't, it wasn't Forgone um, that that you know what what the judgment was going to be, um, and that might be some measure. Um, whatever we think about Tokyo, that that Nuremberg was not necessarily a um, a, a show trial. Um, on the point of uh, Victor's justice, I really appreciated uh, your remarks, um, and it's interesting though, though what you're raising suggests that maybe a good example or a good way of thinking of Victor's justice is not just that the selectivity of what charges are brought during. Um, a, a trial that's already ongoing, um, but other cases that aren't even investigated. Um, and I completely agree that um, that is um, uh, crucial evidence that Victor's justice um, has reigned and perhaps continues to reign in the world, um, given how few atrocity crimes throughout history uh, have actually been adjudicated. Um, and then just to respond to something that Professor Cohen uh, had, had raised in response to my uh, remarks about Unit 731, I didn't say that the book that I mentioned was the first or only book that a Japanese person had written on the point on, on the topic of 731. Of course, there have been others. Um, what I was raising was that there is fresh evidence that has been un uncovered just in the past few years that has led to the publication of this new Japanese book and this documentary and the opening of this museum in China um, that suggests, uh, to respond to something Professor Cryer uh, raised, um, that there are uh, um, still many issues, including, I think, the case of human experimentation um, that merit uh, ongoing um, research. Thank you. A two-finger response. Yes. Um, yeah. C can there be a fair show trial? Well, the first successful show trial was of Vera Zasulich in Tsarist Russia in 1878. And uh, basically, she was acquitted of trying to assassinate uh, the, the uh, principal leader, a uh, political leader in, in, in uh, St. Petersburg, Russia. And from that point on, Russian revolutionaries, uh, really until the, until the Soviets took over, began to sort of use this type of trial system as a soapbox to sort of 
proclaim their revolutionary ideals, the Soviets picked up on this and turned it inside out. And so beginning in the early 1920s, you begin to have a growing series of Soviet show trials. And fast forwarding to Nuremberg, one of the reasons that Stalin agreed to sort of take part is that he saw the opportunity to mimic what had been done in Moscow and earlier, which, which was to grandstand at the, uh, at the uh, Nuremberg trial. They also tried it at Tokyo and it never got anywhere. So the show trial connection does have, have, have a legal precedent that goes back deep into Tsarist, late Tsarist imperial history. Professor Simpson gets a one-finger response, and then I will close our session. At the beginning, I, I look, I, I think just to connect these two questions, that this is at least partly a cultural as well as a, as a legal project. And, and the question we might ask is, what sort of imagined figure of the war criminal or the person who commits crimes against humanity is produced in these trials or in the current experience and practice of international criminal tribunals? And if the idea that's produced is, I don't know, a, a Japanese war criminal or an African warlord, but not Tony Blair or some sort of Western bureaucrat, then maybe we do have a problem with, with war crimes trials. And maybe that problem is somehow related to the very point you made eloquently, I thought, about the relationship between empire and international criminal justice, which is a much more intimate one than we imagine is, is the case. Thank you. If I may respond to what I understood to be the question about the interplay of, of bodies of law, because I'm not sure that was addressed. I, I think that that feeling of alienation from bodies of law, it would not at all surprise me to find out it was present at Tokyo, but it was not absent at Nuremberg as well. Um, in particular, I think of the defense that was raised in cases like von Lieb, um, which was one of the subsequent cases of Kriegsraison, right? The notion that military necessity in the German context meant whatever the military thinks is necessary, which is very different than the contemporary international humanitarian law idea that military necessity is a very constraining um, and bounded principle. And so even in those trials in Germany, you can find evidence of conflict as to what the norms were, and even terms that in military law existed globally, having very different interpretations. And so this sort of forging and synthetic project um, for good or ill, I think, occurs in both theaters. With that, I know that we are all that waits between you and lunch. Um, so I want to thank all of you for your attention, and I hope you'll join me in thanking our panelists.